forgiveness and grace where we seek to show the love of God with one another in our surrounding community. I uh, want to wish a happy anniversary today to Michael and Janet Simons. Um, their flowers are given in honor of their anniversary today. Also, happy birthday to yours truly over here, Kurt Nosebeck. He doesn't want anybody to know we celebrate your birthday today, but it is his birthday. I asked him to play happy birthday to himself on the organ, but he ain't going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael Graff also celebrates his birthday today. Um, prayer cards, again, I understand this process. It's very good that we're learning and retraining ourselves, that the attendance cards are no longer really gathered to get prayers requests to me, so get them via text or emails so I can get them prepared on Sunday morning. I appreciate more and more people getting used to that system. Um, it's very helpful in planning to have uh, good thought out prayers on a worship service on Sunday morning. But we still wish you to fill out those attendance cards to register your attendance at the service on Sunday. Please put them on an offering plate on the way back out of the church this morning. Still looking for some small group leaders as we have a number of people that have joined the church over the past year. We need more small group leaders and we need small group leaders returning. So if you'd be interested in hosting a Bible class for about six, eight people, uh, let me know. Um, and what's really great about that small group is that's a great outreach so that you're inviting people other than those in the church. So if you're a small group leader and you know some people in your neighborhood that have some friends that don't have a church, bring them into the small group. And who knows, that may work in bringing them into this church. It's a great outreach as well. In the same line of thought, the Under Shepherding Program, we're looking for some people in our church willing to, you know, uh, shepherd eight or ten families and helping the elders, making sure that no one falls through the cracks, uh, reaching to them with greetings on birthdays, anniversaries, or hospitalizations. Um, the servant list will be returning in July. We have a voters meeting today at 1 o'clock. The main item on the agenda will be the approval of the budget. Uh, remember again, when you come to receive the sacrament in the consecrate, I mean the sacrament during the continuous communion, the best thing to do is just put your hand in the form of a cross and just let me drop the host in your hand. Don't try to pick it from my hand, just hand over one hand form the cross. Nice and reverent way to receive it. And I'll put that host in your hand that way. There's no hand to hand contact with it. And as you know, I've been sanitizing my hands before all the consecrations, continually since the COVID 19. Um, one thing, I guess, just a word of message and a word of hope. <laughs> all this 2020 thing, COVID 19, and now this major dust cloud coming across our state, you know, all we need is now the plague of the locusts, right? <laughs> Last night, I just saw on the news that there's a big plague of locusts in Africa. So, oh boy. Uh, 70 year cycle of locusts in Africa. Are, uh, but you know, one thing about we have as a Christian, we talked about this in Bible class yesterday, is we have hope. And uh, boy, the world needs our hope. So, think about sharing that message of hope with those around you as they are frustrated, they're depressed about what's happening in the world. We know there's a better world waiting us. We have a hope and, and bring that message. We'd like to now honor our graduates with us. There's three of them in our church this morning. So if they would just mind just standing, we have Keegan, Keegan Walton, who's graduating from Waxahachie. And Zoe is graduating from the Lothian High School. And then Michelle is graduating from Concordia University in Irvine. And we're going to just share with you a little bit on our slideshow now of two things. So you guys can be seated again. Thank you. And we want to honor you today through some of these things. Um, Keegan, as I mentioned, is graduate from Waxahachie High School, Waxahachie High School, and he is yet to determine his future plans from here as he's waiting for God's guidance and direction on what the Lord would have him to do from here on out. Michelle, as I mentioned, from Concordia University, Irvine, Bachelor of Science physics with a mathematics minor. She will be entering Baylor University in Waco at the graduate school in this fall with the goal of achieving a doctoral degree in physics. Also graduating, as mentioned here today, is Lowell Vogt from the Lothian High School, uh, attending and playing soccer for Sagu here in town, and she plans to pursue studies in criminal justice and law enforcement. Others who are not with us in this first service are Colton Castor, graduating from Texas A&M University, 
Bachelor of Science degree in agribusiness and entering the Air Force as a second lieutenant. Caitlin Edsel from Texas A&M also, Bachelor of Science, uh, Agricultural Leadership and Development with a minor in Agronomy and Extension Education. And the first one here on the back is Sarah Bell, um, just joined our church this year along with Keegan from Ennis High School, attending and playing soccer for Eternal University in Longview, Louisiana. She plans to pursue a degree in nursing. Uh, due to the COVID and social distancing, they're not going to have them come up and be next to each other. But if you would like to give them a round of applause at this time. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart to confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave me the of our sin. We take a moment to reflect on our sins before God. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor merciful sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever been to you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your Lord, beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead, by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
Blessed are the people who know the festal shout. Who walk the Lord in the light of your face. Who exalt in your name all the day. And in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord. Our king to the Holy One of Israel. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. <laughs>
that it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson for today comes from Romans 7, verses 1 through 13. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetedness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me, for sin... Seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And the person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not, whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the gospel of our Lord.
And we know, O Lord, that becoming his disciples, as the world rejected Christ, our message will be rejected, and us along with it. Help us, O Lord, to bear this cross of witnessing and testimony to the gospel of Christ, as we know that though it may bring us crosses, maybe one or two that may hear this message, have changed a heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, and join with us in becoming one of your saints for eternity. Help us, O Lord, to stay persistent and stay strong as we deal with the crosses that we lift up and experience due to the message of the gospel. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Friends of Christ, it's amazing, isn't it, that a person can change the atmosphere of a room in an instant? It all depends on your history with that person, right? Someone is having a gathering and you're there. Someone enters the room that you have a history with. If your history is positive, you're glad to see him. Hugs and welcomes and they bring joy and levity to the atmosphere of the room. You have a great positive history. They bring more joy to the gathering. But what happens when that person you have a history with is negative? What do they do to the atmosphere of the room when that person walks in? Isn't there a sense of heaviness, a sense of tension that makes us uncomfortable? And we want to avoid that individual or just excuse ourselves because we can't deal with it anymore. It's amazing how fast an atmosphere can be changed by the entrance of just one individual. The same thing can be said about revelation of fact. When somebody doesn't know a truth about an individual and it's revealed, it can make them feel either joyous or uncomfortable as well. Been in now Waxahachie close to two years, and I had my first invitation from our neighbor. And I was surprised, you know, he's been having his cookouts for all these times on Saturday nights, at least once or twice a month. And when I went out to get the mail this one time, after two years, one of the party members said, hey, would you like to have a beer? I thought, sure, I mean, here's a good chance for me to get to know the neighbor. I want to be cordial and friendly. So we go over there, I go over there, since he's still in the house, I go over there, and uh, he's fishing for a beer in the cooler, and we're having a little small talk and chatting. And after a while, he finds me a Budweiser. I says, this is good because I was in St. Louis, and I'm like, St. Louis beer, so I had a Bud. And, you know, it's not very long before the proverbial question is asked, right? When you meet a stranger? Know what it is, right? What do you do for a living? <laughs> I said, I'm a pastor. And there was a small silence. Lifting <laughs> my Budweiser and taking a sip, I said, Don't worry, I belong to a church that's okay with beer drinking. <laughs> and in response to lowering the tension even further, they said, Don't worry, we wouldn't tell your church anyway. <laughs> Revelation of fact can change an atmosphere. And this is what Jesus kind of tells us this morning in the gospel today, that his presence is going to bring a change in the world. Yet you think that when Jesus enters this world, he's going to bring peace. Yeah, his intent is to bring peace, but he says here, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. The presence of Christ in this world is going to bring tension. Are you guys ready for that? Maybe you're already experiencing it. The presence of Christ is going to bring tension in this world. It's going to make an uncomfortable setting, which we, as Christian disciples, call crosses. So Jesus just is creating a statement of fact. And it seems quite odd, doesn't it, to the first verse we have on the slide today from John 3.17. That Jesus says God did not send him, not to send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So God's intent is to come into the world with peace and salvation. The world, on the other hand, does not receive this with welcoming spirit. As a matter of fact, we look at a couple more verses that kind of tell us the levels of rejection that Jesus experiences as he enters this world. John chapter 1. He was in the world. And the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. How about that? The world does not recognize its own creator. Right 
there, you can see the world in Jesus is going to create a tense atmosphere. When the world will not recognize its own creator. Verse 11. Jesus came to his own. Jesus was born in the flesh and blood of Abraham. And how did the flesh and blood descendants of Abraham receive Jesus? Not so well. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. The whole stage is set for tension. Jesus comes not to bring peace, but a sword. And in the next verse, we see the parable of the vineyard. You're probably familiar with that. How the landowner had this vineyard. And then he went away. And he was looking for the produce, the fruits of the vineyard. He sent one servant after another after another. And they were persecuting and beating them. And then at the very end, he says, you know what? Maybe they'll respect my son. The very end. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him. Seeing the intent of the world against Christ. The world seeks to destroy its creator. Why is that? Look at the next Bible verse up there. Look at the power the world is under. We know that we as Christians are of God. But the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's why the world seeks destruction of its creator, its redeemer. So Jesus is basically making a statement of fact of consequence. It's not that he intends to bring a sword, but it's just what's going to happen when he enters this world. It's the same thing that people were doing against Martin Luther King Jr. this past few months with these riots, they were misunderstanding a quote he said some years ago, where he once said, riots are the voices of the unheard. Some people have used that quote to say Martin Luther King Jr. endorsed riots. No, he didn't endorse riots. He was good with peaceful protest. He was not good with riots. He was just stating a fact of consequence that when voices are not heard, Unfortunately, riots will take place. Not that I endorse them, but that's just the reality. So when Jesus comes into this world, battle lines will be drawn. The world will seek his destruction. God loves his creation. God sends his son Christ to save his creation, but the spirit of the world does not want to lose the world and will do everything it can in its power to seek the, to seek the destruction of the Creator, the Redeemer, and its message of salvation. And that's why you and I as Christians experience crosses. Now crosses are different than the results of sin. Everybody experiences the results of sin, whether you're a believer or not believer. If you are just living and breathing in this world because you are born with sin, you will experience, whether you're a Christian or not, you will experience death, you will experience sickness, you will experience pains and hurts in your family, among friends. That is the effects of sin. Those are not crosses. Crosses are what we experience because we hold Christ crucified to the world. Sometimes, don't you think that the world is against you when you try to say something Christian to it today? That it's you against the world and swords and battle lines are drawn because the world will not have this message survive. The evil one seeks the destruction of the Creator and His message, even to the point that it will destroy those things which it wishes to control. Our country alone right now, we're having a difficult time just having a simple conversation about justice. We can't seem to talk to one another about what is fair and just. Who is behind this? Families seem to struggle with high levels of dysfunctionalism in today's world. What happened last year? Wasn't the mother at the 
had custody just for a moment with her child, she kills herself and her child with the car. That takes a lot of energy to do that. Self-destruction. I was aware of another story just yesterday where a mother was trying to drown her child in the kitchen sink and would have died unless the father entered the house at an appropriate time to save the child. The devil will seek to destroy its own, which it seeks to, which it seeks to have. And the devil is very good at this because maybe you've had these conversations. So when the devil is wreaking havoc and chaos in a world and death and destruction and all this stuff going on in the world, and then you talk to people who go through these experiences, who do the people blame? Does the devil have a way of turning it so that people will blame God? I think so, right? Instead of being blamed for all this havoc and this death and destruction, the devil somehow turns it so that people say, where is God? If there was a God, why is this happening? The devil's a good manipulator. He's good at what he does. And into this world, Jesus comes. Because he's going to knock off this prince pretender. And Jesus comes with a plan. And he follows the plan his father laid out for him. For well, the Father knows that the world is going to reject His Son. And he's going to use the hostility of the world against His Son to save the world. He actually uses the best weapon the devil has against the devil to destroy him. And so in the end, when Christ is dying on that cross, it may seem like the devil was laughing, but three days later, God has the last laugh. He is the Glorious one. The devil loses and he will lose again. Good will conquer evil in the end. That is the hope and the promise we hear in the Bible over and over again. Yes, the hostility of the world brought a cross to Jesus. Through that cross, St. Paul says, we get peace. Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Hostility brings a cross to Jesus and to his followers. But the cross brings us peace with God and with ourselves. Peace that surpasses all understanding. And this gospel of Jesus Christ can do wonders for families who struggle with dysfunctionalism today. Because, you know, the spirit of the world doesn't have to rule the family in order to create chaos and destruction. It just needs to be present. And I've experienced the presence of the spirit of the world in families over the course of my years in the ministry. And it gets really frustrating how to answer that spirit. One example is that People who are very faithful in church attendance, Sunday after Sunday, they're always there. And I'll get this phone call, like on Wednesday or Thursday before that coming Sunday, and say, Pastor, uh, I just want to let you know, we will not be in church on Sunday. I said, oh, well, okay. Well, i got to tell you why. I said, all right, tell me why. Well, my mom and dad are coming into town this weekend, and my dad, not much of a believer, and really he's not much of a churchgoer, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to make him uncomfortable. Who's receiving the first love here? You know, that's what Jesus says. If you love father or mother more than me, you are not a little of me. You see, the truth of functionalism in his family is getting the proper order. It's loving God first, then loving spouse, loving children and family second. You know, year after year after year, I struggle to find that perfect anniversary of Valentine card for Cecilia. It's always hard. Because you can go through these cards and cards and every one of them will say, Oh, you are the receiver of my greatest and first love. And I says, no, I've got to pitch that. You know, I want to look for a card that says, I appreciate the love she gives me. And I appreciate how God has blessed me with her. Because my first love is God. Isn't that what Luther says? 
We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And when you do that, your family will be more functional. Trust me on that. Put God first, family second, and things will run smoother because you're running the way God created you to run. And so when I do not challenge these families who tell me they're not coming because they don't want to make their father uncomfortable by going to church and leaving him at home, my silence enables them to keep their cross on the ground. And I probably, as a pastor, need to do a better job of that. So, you know, maybe your dad needs that witness right now of what you hold primary and dear in your life. Same thing can be happening financially. Conversations I've heard of between spouses is one's very active, one is the writer of the checks, and they're a giver to the church, and they give 10%, maybe even more, and the other one who's not going says, why are you giving so much money to the church? Do you realize what we could be doing with this? Because they just don't get it. But the other one is trying to do what is right. First love of God. Things will run smoother as we carry these crosses in mind. Don't seem to be the way, but it's just the truth. You know, some years ago, Sarah Adams, 1841, wrote a song, Near My God to Thee. Very first line of it. Song is for near. Near my God to thee, near to thee, even though it be a cross that raises me. If it is a cross that brings us salvation, if it is a cross that brings us peace with God, it just makes sense that it will be a cross that brings us closer to God. Sarah had it right. In his name, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. For all people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. This week we received prayer requests for Darren Root, brother-in-law of Deb Montgomery, fighting cancer. A prayer for Doug Hottinger, the son-in-law of Gary Deb Montgomery, dealing with COVID-19 and for protection of the rest of the family members. Prayers for engaged couples whose wedding plans have been altered this summer by COVID-19. Prayers for Daniel Kinsell, relation of the Gosses, who's fighting cancer. Prayers for Jack Van Sent, a friend of Joanne Thompson, suffering from some health issues. And a prayer of comfort for the family and friends of Ron McKelvey, my uncle, who died this past week in Arkansas. The congregation responds to each of the petitions with the word. Hear our prayer. O oh, most merciful God, rule and govern your church, that she may be preserved in the pure doctrine, that thereby faith may be strengthened and love decrease in us. Grant health, wisdom, and integrity to all in authority over us, especially to the President of the United States, the Governor of this state, the Congress, all legislative bodies and all judges and magistrates. According to your gracious will, turn the hearts of our enemies and make them to walk with us in humility and peace. Bless our Board of Stewardship and their efforts to make us better stewards of the gifts you give us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, grant to those in trouble, want and sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, a healthful spirit of your grace for healing, strength, reconciliation, comfort, and relief. Bless especially those who suffer for the sake of your name and your word. Hear us on behalf of Hannah and Brady, Joan Simiak, Doug Cottager, Jack Van Sant, Darren Ruth, Daniel Kinsell, Pam Benson. Louis Dawson, Carla Cates, Larry Fetch, Claire Halanka, Charlie Bell, and Butch King, and those we name in our hearts. Protect your servants from this pandemic, especially those who must serve and live with those who have contracted it. We lift up to your sons as well Joyce Brady, Maxine White, Randy Franz, Cliff Fluella, Bill Hall, and Ray Jorgensen. Give them courage to stand firm in their afflictions and patience until the day of your deliverance. Give comfort and peace to all those who mourn the loss of loved ones, especially the family and friends of Ron McKelvey. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen.
Preserve us, O Lord, from pestilence and every evil. Give to us favorable weather. Cause the fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season. And offer you praise and thanksgiving for all your goodness to us. Lend your blessing to all honorable vocations and honest industry, that we may serve where our skills and abilities may be of good use. Bless the arts and music, that we may please you and be encouraged by all that is good. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Give to all husbands and wives grace to live together in love and faithfulness, so all may be on the same page in the Christian faith. Bless the homes and families of your people, that they may believe places where your name is honored, love is nurtured. Give your special grace to the widow, the orphan, all mothers with child, the aged, and the infirm, that we may grant them comfort, aid, and protection. Give patience and guidance to those couples who had their wedding plans altered due to this pandemic and make it possible for them to celebrate their union as they had hoped. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All these things which you have us ask of you, grant to us for the sake of Jesus, our Lord, through whom we are bold to call you, Father. And in his name we pray, trusting in your mercy and confidence, that you will give answer to our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Upon you, I give you peace. Oh.